you hired me because you know I can do this job and you know that out of all the people you interviewed and all the people who applied, you wanted me. So fire me because I'll get another job. I'm always <laughs> ready to get another job. I'm good at getting another job because I have the knowledge. I have the skill. I have the hard skills. I have the soft skills. I'll do it in English. I'll do it in Spanish. I'll do it in Portuguese. Like, no, don't like, I just, I had no peace growing up. So now that I can control my life, peace is my ultimate. I will not sacrifice my peace. And I will not allow anyone to take advantage of me or to mistreat me in any setting, especially work. Mi gente, what's good? Dímelo, dímelo. Welcome to another episode of the Can't Do It As Podcast brought to you by Plural. You already know, it's your boy Pavel bringing you another special episode with another very special guest. As a reminder, on this podcast, our mission is to redefine professionalism. Because it feels like we've been trained our entire lives to believe that who we are authentically is unprofessional and inappropriate for the workplace. That's not true, though. We're here to help you unlearn that so that you can be your most authentic self at work. Each week, we have a different guest join us for a very candid conversation around their experience between professionalism and authenticity. Speaking of guests, the clip that you heard in the intro is with this week's guest, Vanessa Correa, who recently took the role of vice president and DEI marketing strategy lead at JP Morgan Chase after five years of being at Freddie Mac, where she was the marketing lead for equitable housing initiatives, handling anything from content strategy, brand development, paid media, and marketing events. Outside of work, Vanessa actually hails from the Bronx born to two Puerto Ricans and describes herself as a quintessential 80s baby. Between hip hop, coffee, food, dancing, salsa, art, and travel photography, that's how she would spend all her time if she, I don't know, won the lottery. <laughs> now that you know a little bit more about Vanessa, let's get into this episode. All right, so let's kick it off where we always do with the word authenticity, such a buzzword. But when you hear the word, what does it mean to you? So I was thinking about it because we've been planning this for months. And I was thinking about, for me, it is a mental state in which I consistently keep a boundary from allowing people to make me feel like who I really am is not valid. And it's something that started when I was a child. And then when it comes to the workplace, me showing up with bamboo hoops, me showing up with red lipstick, me showing up in jeans and not slacks every day because I don't interact with bankers. So I don't need to be in slacks every day. Like whatever real pressure or even perceived pressure, sometimes that's us in our own minds, assuming that people expect certain things of us. Authenticity for me is a constant, like my inner dialogue with myself and just not allowing anyone to make me feel like I'm like, you need to edit yourself. There are no versions of me. I'm, you know, in the winter, I wear winter clothes and in the summer, I wear summer clothes. There's context, but I don't edit myself ever. And if I feel like somebody is trying to get me to do that, I have a little talk with myself first and figure out how to prevent what they're trying to do from succeeding. So talk to me when you were growing up, was mm -hmm. it? easy to do that so growing up my and i feel like my experience is from the amount of episodes that i've been able to listen to because i don't know how you crank out so many <laughs> but it, i feel like my my growing up was a little different than most of the people that i've heard their episodes in terms of yes i'm puerto rican my parents were born in puerto rico i was born in the bronx but my experience was very different i grew up with one parent and that parent was abusive and it was a very close experience. And my siblings are seven years older than me and 12 years younger than me. So it was a lot of me having different roles I, in the birth order. I was first the youngest and then I was the only because my older sister moved out real early. Then I was the oldest because my younger sister was born and <laughs> she's 12 years younger than me. So, and then my cousins, my extended family were not in New York City. There, my mother's siblings had moved out of New York when they started having kids. 
So it was, yo no tenía ese corillo, you know, like I wasn't in that. My closest friends were a very small group and they were my friends at school. The one thing that I would say is that I was always performing. The one thing that I am grateful for is that I was placed, in, like I started dancing, singing, gymnastics, todo, todo eso from like three years old. Mm -hmm. And so I, being a performer, I got that very deep sense of identity. And if someone doesn't like me or has an issue with what I'm doing, that's their problem. Because all these people over here, they love it. Like I, I have very vivid memories of being in the Puerto Rican Day Parade through my dance school. We were in the Puerto Rican Day, we, we, the dance company would go down Fifth Avenue in front of the Goya um, float. Mm -hmm. And there was one year that there was some girl had a solo performance and she didn't show up and they picked me. And I was like in front of everybody in the middle of the street, made 10 years old by myself, just doing whatever came to my mind, like in improvising that the joy of the people, like when you're performing and how happy that makes people and how like you're exchanging that positive vibe. I've carried that through from then. And so even when, if I'm in a meeting, I may say something sometimes at work that I'm like, this is going to rub this person the wrong way, but all these other people are going to be glad I finally said it. You know what I mean? Did I answer your question? <laughs> well, yes, I have a better example. I have a better sense of when you were growing up, Yeah. but this idea of not having to edit yourself or you know, as it relates to your authenticity, do you feel, what, what sort of expectations do you think people had for you growing up though? Did you have to show up a certain way? Did you have to uh, study thankfully, a certain thing? Yeah. I was free of that because like mm. I said, because, because it was just us and all the tios and primos and whatever were elsewhere. I didn't grow up with that sense of this is who I need to be in my home environment. I didn't grow up with a, this is what it means to be a woman. This is what it means to be Puerto Rican. This is what it means to be no, nada de eso. So that's why I feel grateful for that, that a lot of the pressure or the, any pressure that comes on me in terms of my true authentic self is external from my family and from my upbringing and my home. There was an element of religion there as well <laughs> later on, but 12 years old and onward, but by 12 years old, I, you know, I had very good use of my middle fingers. So <laughs> <laughs> did you see dance and performance as a viable career option for you long term? No, but because of the religious part. So suddenly, we suddenly halfway through my upbringing, we were suddenly very religious and it was like, oh, it's if it hadn't been for that, I was right behind. I went to the same boys and girls club in the Bronx that Jennifer Lopez went to. I remember seeing her when I was a kid. You know what I mean? Like I, I was in that, but I don't know that, that emotionally, physically, like if you go into acting and singing and all of that, like my parent at the time would not have been able to do all that. You know what I mean? Like you wouldn't, like Jenna Ortega, for instance, she's gone on about her, how her mom would drive her hours to the auditions. Like that wasn't going to happen regardless. And then it was like, oh, by the way, now it's totally wrong to be who you are. Right. Salsa dancing is wrong and you can't be out in the club. And I was just like, okay, yeah, sure. Like I nod and smile, but I do what I want. <laughs> so what other representation did you have growing up around different career fields or different ideas that way? Uh, that was the one thing. So even though my family wasn't around, I knew of them, right? All my mother's side of the family and all her siblings were highly educated and professional. Mm -hmm. So one, my, my understanding is that one of my uncles like got a free ride to Harvard. He's a doctor. La otra, I call her the mayor. Uh, <laughs> she has the biggest house on her street <laughs> uh, in Florida. She was a school principal for a long time. My, my mother had her master's Back in the early 80s, she did social work and was a professional always. And even, you know, my, my one uncle who's not educated has a successful business of his own that he's had forever, right? So that was the tone. Nobody said anything to me. But if I had stopped at my bachelor's, I would have been the least educated person in my family. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So that was part of it, too. It wasn't, again, it wasn't a pressure. It was just, there's a difference between feeling like what surrounds you like nature and nurture right and then like this is the standard set by my family i can choose it or not but it was never vanessa tu tienes que hacer esto porque si no 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 vales like never right 
Mm-hmm. Right. I was just about to ask you, was it ever said directly or just kind of these, you, you know, the story that you told yourself based on the representation that you were seeing? Yep. It sounds like it was the latter. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Interesting. So what kind of, so did you end up getting sort of like above the undergraduate degree? Yeah. And get seeking yeah. higher education? <laughs> I'm laughing because I had no, like I got to my bachelor's and I had, let me back up even more. When I finished high school, I didn't have anybody who told me, here is the wide world of American professionalism. And if you want to go be an accountant, you can do that. Or if you want to do marketing, you can do that. Like I had no understanding of how the world functioned. And I was 17 when I started my freshman year picking a major, right? Wait, but you had all these people that went to school though. So the lack of communication and pressure was also a lack of like, hey, guidance. Interesting. Because we weren't close, right? I was only with them once a year, but there was no framework for me, with, neither within my home or in my immediate family. On paper, on paper, you look like a Nepo baby. Right. Yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But nobody, Inter- nobody sat around, you know, the asado and told me stories yeah. of how they got their first job and like, this is what you should do. Like, mm. no, no. And so I say all that to say though, that when I, by the time I finished my bachelor's, it was only my fourth year, I did it in four years, a friend of mine, shared with me her life like plan and I jacked it and I was no, like, I jacked it. <laughs> that's what I'm gonna do and like the crazy thing for me is that she ended up not doing it but she was the one who told me and we're friends to this day Cecile I love you she said she was sharing with me because we were working on the newspaper together she was the campus newspaper she was the editor I was the assistant editor and so she was telling me yeah I'm gonna go get my master's in publishing at NYU and I was like Tell me more. <laughs> Literally, if it wasn't for her, I don't know how I would have ended up there. And then I, and then the plan was to be a book editor, which I was for a couple of years, but I took my first marketing class ever in life because my undergrad was English and Spanish. I took my first marketing class during my master's and I was like, oh, fucking ruined my life plan. <laughs> and like, so this I was is, a book editor for it. a couple of years, but then I was just bored. I fell in love with marketing and now it's the work that I would do if I won the lottery. So that's how that, that journey ended up happening yeah <laughs> that's so funny that she didn't even fulfill her life yeah, plan. like you literally yeah. took it no, like she, she i mean she yeah um, she's in academia she's done publishing but just didn't you know go to new york and do the degree yo i'm fascinated by people that seek like graduate degrees like you can't pay me to go back to school yeah. I hated school and maybe I could see it from a different lens now, but I think I was way too young to go to college, not actually age wise, but just like mentally, yeah. I don't think I was ready. And also I wish I had the privilege to study something that I was actually interested in. Yeah. I just went to go economics because I wanted to get a job. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. Realizing now low key i would either go into like journalism or something to become a therapist no i hear you i don't know that i needed a master's at 25 right i Mm -hmm. I could have waited to do that too but at the time i saw it as a fast track to skipping entry-level work yeah and so i think most people do yeah 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 but to your point it was kind of the opposite for me that i knew when i graduated high school I, i can't math I'm not going to be a lawyer. I'm not going to be a doctor. I need this degree to get a job, right? There was no way. I took economics and almost failed. Oh, I failed my first economics class. But my point being, like, I was like, (laughs) "Mm, the only skills I have are reading and writing. So English major, like, that's how that happened. (laughs) Interesting. I mean, yo, NYU is a prestigious school, though. Like, that's a big name. I'm wondering, I mean, here you are, Puerto Rican girl from the Bronx, studying at this very competitive school to get into was it a bit of a culture shock for you yes and no so one in el asunto que yo soy bien cabrona like whoever by that age <laughs> whoever doesn't put me in their program is stupid and i applied for the one it wasn't oh let me apply for several because i didn't have the cash at the time to be pay- paying those application fees but also literally there's no way i'm not going to get in and my the essay for my application, I wrote a case study on how, despite 
where this person is at right now and how problematic she is. J.K. Rowling, you know, the author of Harry Potter, shopped the first book around for a year and a half. And why did that many publishers miss that opportunity? And that's wow. why I wanted to go into publishing because I wanted to contribute to the literal world what was being missed, right? In, in a backwards way, backing into the idea, y'all have too many of the same kind of people in your companies, therefore you're missing things. Diversity of thought has been shown statistically, research, whatever, what have you, to improve business outcomes. So that was the rationale of my letter convincing them to let me into the program. And I literally, as I signed it, like, see you soon. <laughs> it, did. it did. But you said yes and no. So yes, you had the confidence that you were going to get in. Like was it a culture shock? I will say, and going back kind of to the overall themes of your podcast, that I cannot recall any time that I feel someone was racist to my face or made fun of me to my face or discriminate against me to my face. I don't, and even microaggressions, I don't really experience because como dije, yo soy bien cabrona. I think I was a young girl walking around New York City by myself. I developed a sense of don't fuck with me to protect myself physically, but I think I carry that now everywhere, right? So people are not open to my face, but what I experienced for the first time at NYU, which I will say, at least in my cohort, in my program, in my school, the School of Professional Studies, was diverse enough and it was 90% women, right? Mm. So it wasn't that, but it was definitely the first time I've never experienced microaggressions, but it was my first experience with micro entitlements mm. and people feeling entitled to my intelligence. And so I, long story short, there was a woman who was in my same cohort. It's four semesters, so she was in a lot of my classes. My, my project for a midterm for one class, she took that idea and used it exactly the way it was as her final project for a different class. And this was the last semester. So I didn't even have the time or the desire to report her, and then how would I prove it? But when I tell you that woman was doing the presentation, looking at everybody in the room except at me, because wow. we both knew it was exactly my work, like being entitled to my ideas and my intelligence, that is the first time I've ever had that happen to me. And to me, it, like, it sounds like a big deal, but in the end of it, I call it micro entitlement because it's just real sneaky. And it was like, like real, you know, <laughs> just and yeah, I was in the same <laughs> class too. At least do it in the class where we're not both in. But that's my point because I know I'm gonna get away with it. I'm entitled. Mm -hmm. So that was my first, and that has been my issue. If the, if there's one issue I've had consistently throughout my career is with white women taking my ideas or treating me like the help or not giving me credit where credit is due. To me, that's where I came up with the term micro entitlements. Interesting. Well. Yeah. Was that, was the scenario you're referencing when you said throughout your career, was that earlier in your career or later in your career? Literally. So I did my bachelor's, then I went abroad and did work out there. That's kind of like technically my first post bachelor's, you know, year of experience, but it was really after my master's that I went into two years of publishing. And then I went on to, I converted by the end of it, the two years of publishing, my job was mostly marketing and that's how I was able to get marketing roles ever since, but it's definitely. It hasn't been a constant, but it has happened here and there. Like I also, there was another job I had where I was the only person on the team that refused to do somebody else's work. So there's a group of people, there's one person who gets away with doing nothing. And I would be approached by my superior and be directed to do something that I knew was her, was this other person's job, not mine. What makes you think that you can come to me and tell me to do somebody else's job. Because if you have a team and people are, you know, your subject is beach balls and your subject is, you know, umbrellas and your subject is folding chairs and I'm on, and I'm on umbrellas, don't come ask me to do chairs. Chairs right. is her job. And, I, and, it, and it felt like a micro entitlement. I can't imagine a person of color doing that to me. I really can't. And it was constant and I kept my boundaries and I, but I had to do it over and over because I had worked so many times before 
with so many other people, but I'm not the one. Like, wait, but you're saying that was never you? Like, you were never the one? Like, you always were very always good about setting boundaries? I always said no. That's incredible, though. Even <laughs> I would understand someone a little bit later in their career having the wherewithal to set boundaries but if you're early in your career many of us are thinking well I'm i gotta earn my stripes or whatever the corporate bullshit is or i gotta pay my dues yeah i gotta build up the resume and the credibility to be able to do this right if i if i'm difficult to work with quote unquote yeah. just by putting up a boundary which i don't think that's difficult to work with like you're literally just putting up a boundary mm -hmm. but we get labels then mm -hmm. maybe i'm not going to get the next opportunity that's going to help me build my resume et cetera, et cetera. so you telling me you never had that you always no, were just like i'll tell you two things one that's the part where growing up with an abusive parent comes into play because that's mm -hmm. the silver lining there was that i had my boundaries violated all the time so I learned by 18 to put my boundary real clear and reinforce it and see that coming from a mile away. I see what you're trying to do. By the time you get here, I'm already ready for you. Not I. <laughs> That's part of it. But the second part too is I'm dyslexic. And my reasoning, I realized, is the total opposite. And everything that you just said, I feel it 100%. I've seen it. But the way my brain works is the opposite. You hired me because you know I can do this job and you know that out of all the people you interviewed and all the people who applied, you wanted me. So fire me because I'll get another job. I'm <laughs> always ready to get another job. I'm good at getting another job because I have the knowledge. I have the skill. I have the hard skills. I have the soft skills. I'll do it in English. I'll do it in Spanish. I'll do it in Portuguese. Like, no, don't like, I just, I had no peace growing up. So now that i can control my life peace is my ultimate i will not sacrifice my peace and i will not allow anyone to take advantage of me or to mistreat me in any setting especially work i love where you are and it's thank you something that is why i have these conversations it's why i scale this content because i want people to see that and get inspiration and be like, oh, there's other people doing that and thriving at work. I do want to check in though, in those scenarios, it's funny because organizations, they tell us to put up our boundaries. They tell us to do all these things, right? But really at this, to. <laughs> I was going to say, we can't control how people receive us though, right? So right. when you do these things, how do you think you have been received? So I want to, I'll answer that question, but I want to be clear that this is not me saying that I'm fearless. It's saying that I'm, I've learned to do things afraid, right? Yeah, yeah. Fear is natural. Right, right. But I think when people hear me and how confident I am and when I can honestly tell you that I don't allow anyone to mistreat or misrespect, like disrespect me, it's not because I'm afraid. I do it afraid. Like every time I have to speak up for myself, I'm a little afraid. But mm -hmm. what's worse? Either I speak up and I get fired or I don't, and I so, like little by little, like lose my soul and my peace. Like that's not a good alternative either. So for example, I've previously had someone raise his voice at me on the phone. And this is, this person is a client of mine internal to an organization. And I literally said, I don't respond to yelling. I need you to lower your voice. And this was on the phone. And why did I say that? Because I had said that to my parent a million times, right? So I'm saying this to this man and he says, well, I, you know, it's not directed at you. I said, but I'm the one on the phone. So if you want to have a good working relationship with me, I'd like you to please lower your voice or we can talk at another time. So for me, it's more about bringing, finding the right words in the moment. Nobody can call me. They can if they want to, but they'd be lying if they call me unprofessional, right? He raised his voice at me. I didn't raise my voice back. I didn't, you know, I didn't go to HR. I didn't, I was just like, you don't know me yet. Clearly you've been working with people who are okay with being yelled at, but we're not, you don't know me yet. So I'm going to help you understand me better. And once we understand each other, I, the respect that you get after that is palpable for me is palpable. So I'd rather take the risk and have that respect. 
then let it slide and then try to fix it later because it's later really it's difficult to fix later because then yeah. you get asked things like well give me an example and then you got to remember the whole conversation exactly how it happened because if you miss up a word they're like i never said that it's hard to come back from that where you set the precedent really early on around that but going back to the question how do you think you've been received though the truth is one there's no way for me to really know unless they i mean unless they tell you or like with the or there's some the, sort of repercussions right or some sort of looks that people give you potentially right right right, yeah. right. but i that's my point that when it happens never happened again i <sighs> highly doubt that person woke up the next day and suddenly wasn't a yeller. I think that person woke up the next day and realized I can yell at whoever I can't yell at Vanessa. And so in terms of how that was received, people receive my messages. I know that my message gets through what a person chooses to do with that message is I don't think about it because it's not my responsibility. Again, I grew up with somebody who was always mad at me, no matter what I did. So blowback is not ever really a concern for me and by and large the behavior is different because i said something that needed to be said interesting okay. yeah well a lot of what we spoke about hasn't even touched on like appearance as well and i think one of the things in which is when i came across you as a person i think was because you changed your LinkedIn profile one mm -hmm. day. And I thought it was such a powerful message that was worth having a conversation around. In your early career experiences, what did your swag look like? How did you show up to work compared to now? Was it any different? There's only one thing that has been different about my appearance, and that was being grown up with the idea that straight hair was more presentable, whether mm -hmm. it was at work or whether I was going to a fancy you know, gala at night or whether it was the very first interview. But again, that was kind of a mix of media and the reality of being in New York City is a whole different universe than growing up elsewhere. And so for me, it was a lot of my mother invested money into my hair. She took me to professional hairstylists who, and she spent good money on good hair products. So I understood that my hair was beautiful from a very young age, right? For someone to spend all this money and product like Nexus products and Biolage products back in the day, like it was $20 a bottle. That was a lot of money in the nineties. Yeah. Right? So I got that message that like my natural curls were beautiful, but somewhere along in high school, you're a 14 year old girl. You want to fit in. You want to look fancy. I used to iron my hair with a clothes iron. And then I reached a certain age where I had to choose between the two because some, for some reason in my early thirties. If I ironed my hair too much, it would dry straight out of the shower and not like a good straight, like a mop, very ugly. So in 2018, I pixied it and I said, if I have to choose between the two, I'm going to choose my hair the way God gave it to me, the way it grows out of my head, because ain't nothing wrong with that hair. I will say though, that my grandmother, my, my father's mother, she was that person. She was also very educated at the time for her generation. She was 16 in 1950. I can't math. She did like take certifications and she was a secretary and she was out in the world, you know, in the fifties and sixties, she was the one who was like, you got to have straight hair. If somebody's going to take you seriously, professionally. Yeah. And yeah. she only said it to me once. It wasn't this constant barrage of trying to alter my identity, but so I had true. an idea. And so I, I made a conscious decision in 2018 that from here on out, anyone who ever interviews me, anyone who ever works with me, anyone who ever sees me in a professional setting, in an office, whatever, that person will never have seen me any other way. They can't imagine me with straight hair because I don't have straight hair. And so when I changed my profile picture, that's what it was. Like I, I got that headshot taken at a company that I was previously working at and I made the conscious decision to like, I came with my pick and I picked out my hair and made it as big as possible and my bright red lipstick and my hoops, because why not? Because that's who I am. And if that's not who you want, don't interview me. Don't hire me. I don't want to work for you either. Mm -hmm. It's a two way street. So that was part of it as well. I want to be seen for who I am, but I don't want people to associate me with my hair. I want them to associate me with my brain. And that's the part of it where it's in terms of professionalism. 
it, to me, that's level one. Do you think I'm yeah. unprofessional because my hair is curly, but deeper than that, like I, there's more to my diversity and my culture and being Puerto Rican than my hair being curly. A lot of it is my work ethic. A lot of it is my willingness to say hard things. A lot of it is my willingness and my thinking outside the box. I attribute that a lot to my cultural roots. Um, and so that's the value that I feel my culture brings into the situation. And so I'm always like, yes, it is a big statement that my profile picture is as curly hair, but it's also like the smallest statement that I'm making professionally. Does that make any sense? No, hundred percent. I mean, yeah. when I think the fascinating thing is that, you know, I always start the podcast with the word authenticity and what I found is that it means something different to everybody. Mm -hmm. Not one person has answered the question the same. And, you know, when we talk about authenticity, how we show up in the world, it has so much more to do than looks. But I do think that I have found in these episodes is that looks is often like the first thing that we start faking it with or assimilating. Because it's the first but, thing anybody sees. It's the first thing anybody knows about you, for sure. Yeah. Exactly. So, yeah. you know, this idea of the first impression, like, that's what we want to. Yeah. That's we want to put our best foot forward, quote unquote. And then we get to impress them with, you know, our skills and how we talk and blah, blah, blah. But that's why I often check in with that, because yeah. it's often the first thing that we start giving up. Yeah. My what well, the first impression that I want somebody to have of me is that. I am genuine and that I add a ton of value mm -hmm. and that my ideas, the ideas and the skills and the, the combination, unique combination I have of all those things, you're not going to find it in somebody else. There's only one of me. Mm -hmm. So it's equally important that my hair is curly as what comes out of my mouth and the ideas that I have. And the, you know, a lot of it for me, my personal brand is me saying, I disagree. I don't, everybody, you know, cause we're consensus building, right. And we want, you know, if there's 10 cooks in the kitchen, are, do we all agree? If I don't agree, I don't say that I do. If everybody loves the design and I don't love it, I don't keep my mouth shut for the sake of, Hey, everybody else likes it. So I'm just going to leave it alone. Like that, that's the value that I bring that I'm not afraid to be different to your point earlier about these companies and corporations saying they want diversity. You said you want my true self. My true self is telling you that I think that strategy is a bad idea. And I'm going to tell you why. And if you take, you know, you take it with a grain of salt, this is your company. <laughs> I don't own it. Right. Not a, the answer to my thoughts or my requests at work can't always be yes, but it can't always be no either. Yeah. I remember like the day that I got labeled aggressive, it was because I disagreed with someone. Like we left the meeting and we're all in an Uber and I, somebody was like, oh, that meeting went really well, right? And I was like, oh yeah, but you know, I ended up saying I disagree with the solution you proposed in the meeting to one of my teammates. Yeah. And they were like, why? Why? I gave the feedback with data to support, et cetera, et cetera. And you know, they raised their voice at me. I was like, what? All right. So like, you know, I raised it in return, whatever. I get the label. But during the conversation though, it was like, right. but we're a team. We have to come to a consensus. We have to agree. And during the conversation, I was like, listen, if that's how y'all want to roll and I'm in the minority, like I'm happy moving forward with the recommendation, but I want to let you know that I disagree. Right. And I think that disagreement was also like, and maybe it's a sense of like entitlement. I don't really know what it is, but I think it was very like triggering for some of the people that I was talking to. For sure. It was like, no, you're not supposed to disagree. Even if yeah. you do disagree, you got to agree. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. No, it's, that, it's, that is it's frustrating. It's frustrating because to your point is, yeah. and, and you know, the funny thing about diversity too, like whenever they say diversity, because what they really want to say with diversity is let's get some more people call in the room. But instead of saying that, they intentionally say diversity of thought, which is like, we're supposed to disagree. Is That's what diverse, you know what I mean? If we all agree, then is that diversity? Like you want diversity of thought, but you don't want me to, it's confusing as hell. What I will say too, and I'm laughing because now I'm at this level, middle management, I think that's where the breakdown happens. I, I, I don't discredit the people at the very top of these ladders and the people who are CEO and I have no desire ever in my life to be CEO of a corporation or a conglomerate, right? I don't envy that and, I, and the weight of that 
is massive. But when when you get down, you know, trickling down, it's almost like playing telephone yeah. and stuff gets lost. And so I do feel that sometimes if I'm this is the talk that I'm getting in the employee messaging, but this is my experience with yeah. my immediate my peers or the people who are immediately above me, I allow grace for that breakdown to happen. And I, when I find a good team, stay as long as I can, right? So at the end of the day, especially if we're talking big companies specifically, when you come in, you have no way of knowing what you're coming into. And so, you know, currently, like right now, I've come into an extremely good team. My boss is amazing and I'm super grateful for that. And I have the psychological safety to disagree. And I know that the people around me that need to work with me want to hear my true thoughts and how uncommon that is and how it's kind of like the luck of the draw. And then that's why a lot of people go off and do their own thing and start their own companies and start their own businesses because it's more often than not the intention of the diversity directive from the top just gets so bleh. Yeah. <laughs> and I often tell people, right, when they have bad experiences at a company, like, it may not be like, yo, fuck that whole company. It may just be your specific team that you're on. Right. There may be out of a hundred teams that are there, like 90 of them are amazing. You just got stuck with the, right. the one out of 10 team that sucks. It's just unfortunate. Like so much of your experience has to do with like the handful of people that you work with, like consistently on a daily basis. But it's also that I, to your point, this is the enlightened 39 year old Vanessa, like 19 year old Vanessa was like, fuck those corporations, yeah. <laughs> all evil, all of them. <laughs> I'm yeah. never going to work for them. They're, they are the problem in society and I'm never going to join them. And then it was like a student debt was like, hold my beer. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know what I mean? But again, it, it takes a certain amount of experiences over time and a certain level of just, you've been enough places to know they're not all good and they're not all bad and that. I can get behind the company that I'm with now because there, there is enough commitment and successful execution on the strategy to be the solution. I want to go back to something you said earlier around, you know, being in an abusive household and you said something around a moment where you were just like, nah, I'm done with this. And you mentioned 18 a few times and I want to check in on that and see 18 is a significant number because like legally you, you can legally do your own thing essentially right yeah. you're not under someone a parent right was it that or was it some sort of experience that flipped a switch for you where you were just like there was a big change it was 18 my 18 was the first time i was out of new york city which was a lot of it new york can be a very negative place it can is a lot of hostile energy around you it can make you somebody that you're not really right the person that i felt that i needed to be to lessen my chances of being assaulted or being harassed or being whatever that wasn't the real vanessa right and so it was my first 18 was the first time i was out of new york it was the first time that i was away from my parents for an extended amount of time in my entire where'd you life. go i went to michigan i went to a religious school tiny town there were three stoplights. There were more cows than people. The first stoplight was uptown. <laughs> the second <laughs> one was midtown. <laughs> I <laughs> you not. And the third one was downtown. And that was where the supermarket was. And people would be like, oh, I got to go downtown. And I'd be like, <laughs> anyway, so all the above, 18 was a very, it was a very large, even maybe more than most people, if they start going to college, but they're still at home or if they start going to college, but they're still in the same city where they grew up. So for me, it was a huge break and shift. And I had the time and the space and again, the safety to figure out who I really was. So how did you start figuring that out? I spent a lot of time alone. My freshman year, I was not out there trying to make besties. I didn't get a I did get a job, but like I'm, I was like not I wasn't there to, to date. I didn't date in college. I wasn't there to, you know, waste time. I never really started drinking. So I didn't, I wasn't wasting my time away drinking. Like my freshman year was a lot of time with me, myself and I, and my, my roommate at the time, she was an international student from Kenya, beautiful woman. And it was a very great pairing. She also was very mature, very about her business. She went to nursing school. 
And so it, it was more like having the space to slow down, to, to really improve my relationship with myself and determine, okay, this is me. This is not me. Gotta get it, get rid of it. And you know what I mean? So it wasn't like, I'm going to college to a lot of people. I feel like they go to college to have fun, like to be distracted. And so like, I'm young, like, ah! and I was at some point, I'm not going to be this young anymore. So I got to think about who I'm becoming right now. And what did you start? Whether it's unlearning, discovering, I want to, I want to learn more about that path you had, the thought process. I became way less guarded and way less afraid of being on the receiving end. Like I'm, I'm, I was always ready for an attack. I had my shoulders up to my ears, whether it was inside my home or outside my home. So being in the middle of nowhere in farmland in Michigan, like there was no, like it was a joke that there were police because what were they going to like, what to like hold <laughs> somebody's pencil, like, you Cow know, Cow tipping I mean? maybe. <laughs> so that extreme moving from the extreme of New York City to the extreme of like farmland USA, I was able to really calm down and not for nothing. Like in New York, it took me an hour and 45 minutes to get to high school. I didn't have yeah. time to even eat breakfast, yeah. to like person, you know? <laughs> so it was just a lot of that, me unlearning and letting go of my armor and unlearning. I didn't, I, to be I, the key, I would say between 17, 18 and 21, I learned how to be strong without being forceful and without being, I didn't have to be on the offensive. I didn't have to attack before I was attacked. I didn't have to, I could be strong and I could be heard without raising my voice. That was new for me. And like, did you just journal all day? Did you did. read books? I did a lot of journaling. Did it's you, funny that you say that. Did so you that also find too. help as well? <laughs> or were you doing all of this alone? I didn't. I've never been to therapy. I still need to go. <laughs> That's still on really? my list. <laughs> yes, but to wow. your point, I don't know if anybody's old enough to remember a website called Zanga. X A N G A. I literally just started like writing everything. Who knows who read that? I don't know. It was like <laughs> the prehistoric age of blogging, but I did. It was a lot. It was a lot of journaling. And thank you. I mean, thank you to my friends. I've had, I didn't have the best parents. I haven't always had the best experiences, but the friends that have been put in my life, like divine power, like on God, like, or like my sisters, my ride or dies. Like I had a friend tell me once, you hate men. You realize that, right? And I, I didn't. And then I'm thinking about all the times that I got harassed in my uniform skirt or all the times that I felt somebody undress me with his eyes, even though you could be my father, like I carried that and I had no idea. And it was a friend who told me and the good or the bad things about me. I had another friend tell me, you were really driven. That is awesome. I didn't think I was driven. I was like, do you got bills to pay? You better be driven. Like, what do you mean? You know? So then you realize not everybody is. And then I'm assuming you started using intentionally you start using those potentially as journal prompts and slowly you sure. just start getting to know yourself and unraveling that. Yeah. Yeah. But also I'm not a religious person, but I pray a lot. I've spent a lot of time and praying also just helps me sort through and regulate my nervous system. I love journaling. I just did a whole episode on journaling with my friend Odalis and it's interesting. Like we've taken up like different journaling, techniques or practices but i used to just like write and mm -hmm. from notebook i transitioned into my ipad and i recently started practicing like voice notes essentially mm -hmm. like i'll just talk out loud for like 30 minutes and that's my new shit but you go back and listen or go back and read it at some point no that's the key i know everyone says that but like i just need to transfer that energy yeah. and the thoughts out of my head no, I as long as i do that i'm good but for me again to, to your question before about like how did you transform that's part of the transformation i would go at the end of the school year and read through and be like damn i'm a different person now than i was nine months ago oh because if it, like <laughs> like if the only other way that you can see your growth is if you're put in another traumatic situation and if you deal with it differently but like, sure. who wants to put themselves through that? Another way is literally just reading, yo, January 1st, damn, that was me. Oh my God, what a mess, get Leo. Mm -hmm. Now I'm like, oh shit, 
right? December 31st, whatever, read through. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. I really was in love with that fool. <laughs> Six months later, I'm like, wait a minute, why did I date him in the first place? Yo, I could have done so much better. <laughs> That's so funny. Well, listen, as we wrap up, I wanted to ask you this last question. What's the one thing that encourages you or inspires you to continue being your most authentic self in these spaces? So my father, I only saw him... I can count on both hands. I grew up without him. My parents divorced when I was an infant. I never lived with him. I never lived with any man. <laughs> Love that for me. He, the one time I did see him again, it was around like the key ages in my life were like 12 and like 16, 17, around there. When I was 12 years old, he said to me, he walked me around the hood, right? Cause I'm from like full disclosure. We were, by the time I was in high school, all the way up north in like Co-op City, which is not the same as like St. Mary's 149 where my mother grew up in the sixties, okay? So he took me all around that same neighborhood too. And he was like, I had my first fight here. This is where I went to school with the nuns. Can I say, okay. And he looked at me and he said, there's, you have to be who you are. If you are not yourself, you are going to be miserable. You can't be anybody else because everybody else is taken. And he told me this, my father told me this. So I'm telling you, and I, that stuck with me forever, forever. I remember we were under the five train Jackson Avenue station and, I, and next to the gate in, in front of the public housing building right there. And so for me, it's just me not forgetting that for better or for worse, there's some days when it's awesome to be me. And there's other days when I feel like it sucks to be me, but there's only, I can't run away from myself and I shouldn't try to be someone else. So that's what keeps me from, there is no giving up. There is no plan B. There is no other option. I am who I am for better or worse, but at the end of it, like, I really like who I am. I haven't gone to therapy, but I have done a lot of other emotional and mental work to have the peace that I spoke of, to love who I see in the mirror, whether I see a woman with curly hair or a woman who's not afraid to speak up for herself. A woman who refuses to be overworked, a woman who refuses to be taken for granted or disrespected. Like, I love myself. I am so awesome that I'm committed to that awesomeness. <laughs> and I've learned to rest instead of quitting. Mi gente, that wraps up another episode of the Gendueras podcast. If you enjoyed what you heard, do us a favor, like, share, comment, tell a friend to tell a friend. And if there's option to leave a rating and a review, please do so. Because... It's going to help us in the algorithms to ensure that these experiences get heard by as many people as possible. That's the only way that we're going to redefine professionalism through sharing our experiences. Thank you. See you next time.